And today we're going to begin our Easter series by uh, looking at Palm Sunday. If you know the background to that, um, I gather last week when we lost live stream, um, somebody came up with the idea on the chat of having a Mexican wave. I'm not quite sure how that works on a, a, a chat stream, but apparently uh, you all had a go at it, which is fantastic. Now, in the time of Jesus, the equivalent of doing a Mexican wave was what they did on the triumphal entry uh, in uh, Matthew chapter 21 that we'll be reading in a moment. And everyone uh, gathered uh, leaves that they took off the palm trees around and they heralded the coming of Jesus and they did their own version of a probably an Israelite wave as opposed to a Mexican wave but they heralded the king who was coming and so I'm going to read now from uh, Matthew 21 and from the triumphal entry uh, I'm hoping the words are going to come up on your street screen you can either listen to me or you could read along uh, the words of the passage so Matthew chapter 21 reading together is called Jesus comes to Jerusalem as king as they approached uh, Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says to you, um, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others could cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, I'm really excited about uh, the message I've got to bring this morning. Um, three times in my life, um, I've woken up in the middle of night and I've had a dream. And in the dream, I've been preaching a message. And uh, each of the times, it's felt like God has been downloading to me uh, a message that's quite prophetic, um, that he wants us to hear, that has significance for the time and the moment. And uh, at the beginning of this week, while well, I'd uh, begun to uh, prepare this passage and I was uh, ruminating on it a little bit, I woke up in the middle of the night on Monday night and God downloaded uh, this message to me. So I feel like there's something really significant in it. Um, and so I want to encourage you to tune in. I, uh, maybe you want to take some notes and uh, remember some particular points. But I, I have a feeling that God is going to speak something significant that uh, many of us need to hear in our hearts and our lives uh, as we gathered this morning. Um, what was interesting in the dream is it came in the form of a, something that's called a discovery Bible study. Now, I don't know whether you've ever heard that term. Um, and uh, it, it's a term that was uh, coined, I think, by cross-cultural workers, cross-cultural cultural missionaries and uh, they were uh, often been uh, working with people who don't know much about the bible and so they use a tool called a discovery bible uh, um, study um, and the way that they do it is they do this they take a story from the bible like the triumphal entry someone reads it and then other people that are gathered get the opportunity to retell the story. So kind of a way to check that you've been tuning in. So people retell the story. And then they simply ask three questions from the story. They ask, number one, what does this story tell me about Jesus? Number two, what does this story tell me about myself? And number three, what do I need to change as a result? And in my dream, uh, the preach that God downloaded to me had exactly those three sections in it. So what does this passage tell me about Jesus? What does this passage tell me about me? And how do I need to respond? What do I need to change as a result? So looking at those three categories, what does this passage tell us about Jesus? Well, for me, um, what I felt God was saying is, number one, what this tells us about Jesus is Jesus has got everything in hand. Jesus has got 
everything in hand. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, if you look through the Gospels and the stories of Jesus, actually a lot of the um, activity seems to happen quite spontaneously. So Jesus is just leaving the city of Jericho and a blind man calls out to Jesus and Jesus hears the cry and then he stops, answers and heals the guy. And it feels like a very spontaneous event or a whole crowd of people turn up unexpectedly um, because they want to be with Jesus. Jesus downloads a whole load of teaching and then it's towards the end of the day and Jesus realizes that people are really uh, hungry. Now the disciples hadn't brought along a whole load of food because they hadn't been anticipating this was happening. So they gather together what they have or they take a little boy's uh, lunch. And uh, Jesus offers it up to God and it multiplies and feeds everyone. So there's a sense right the way through the Gospels of God spontaneously working through Jesus. And then we get to the triumphal entry. And what's different about it is it seems to be pre-planned. And so Jesus says to disciples, actually, there's a village over there. If you go over there, you'll find a donkey and it's colt. And uh, if a man stops you and says, uh, what are you doing? Say, the Lord has need of it and he will instantly uh, let it go and let you take it. And then you bring it to me. And when the disciples go and they obey Jesus, they find things exactly how Jesus had laid them out. Now, why when a lot of the activity in the Gospels had been quite spontaneous, why was there something so intentional and pre-planned? Well, I think the reason uh, that Jesus chose to do it this way is because Holy Week actually was going to be quite an unsettling week for the disciples. I think a lot was going to happen that was going to confuse them and bewilder them. And right at the very beginning, he wanted to give a message to them that says, I've got it and this is going to be okay." And I felt that one of the things that God wanted to speak to us, particularly at the moment, is I've got it and this is going to be okay." And there's a story I tell quite often um, on the Living Free course when we do that. And it's about the first time I went to my very own uh, Living Free uh, experience. And uh, as a part of the Living Free conference, we uh, have an opportunity to have a prayer appointment. And uh, the Living Free conference that I went to, um, I was uh, staying about 10 minutes away from where my prayer appointment would be. And on the morning of my prayer appointment... Um, When I got up, I had a real strange feeling like I needed to try and be there really early. Now, I'm someone who I hate being late for anything. And so I like to be there early. But as a result of that, I normally spend a whole load of time waiting places because I get there way too early. So um, on this morning, I knew my prayer appointment was in about an hour's time. I knew it would take only 10 minutes to get there. But inside, I was feeling like you ought to go, you ought to go. And uh, a voice was telling me, no, that's crazy, Ian, that's crazy. You've got way too much time. You'll just be bored and get there. So I deliberately or worked hard at uh, holding myself back from going too early. But about 40 minutes before my prayer appointment, I finally decided, OK, go now. So I got in my car to go and lo and behold, I went round the corner and I hit instantly a massive traffic jam. And everything within me started churning up. And I was like, why didn't you listen to that voice? Why didn't you go earlier? This isn't going to clear in time. You're not going to get there on time. And I got really, really stressed. In the middle of getting really, really stressed, I stopped and I said to God, God, are you wanting to raise something that's going to be significant in my prayer appointment? Now, the traffic didn't clear. It was a really tight uh, journey, but I managed to get to my prayer appointment just in time. I got to my prayer appointment. I sat down. The people that I was praying with, they prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to reveal something to me that would be key for helping set my life free. And uh, uh, as they were sitting there praying, um, a lady looked up and she said, I've got a picture of a train and uh, you at the station, does it mean anything? And instantly when she said that, I remembered a story or a time when I was 15 or 16 years old and I had to catch a train to go to London. Now, we lived at that time about 10 minutes away from uh, the train station, but I needed my dad to drive me to get me to the train on on time. Now, my dad didn't used to love uh, getting to places early, so uh, my dad left it to the absolute last possible minute to leave home. And uh, we belted down streets 
um, for the 10 minute journey to get me to the train station. And all the way through those 10 minutes, I thought, I'm gonna miss the train. I'm gonna miss the train. I'm gonna miss the train. And I got really, really stressed. Now, fortunately, we got there just on time. I ran from the car door, got through the ticket barrier and managed to catch the train and caught it to London. But the lady in the prayer meeting said, from that experience, what was the lie that you started to believe? And instantly what came out of my mouth was, my dad won't get me there. And I realized there was an event from my past that was affecting my ability to trust God right here and right now. And I realized I needed to repent of the impact of that lie that I was living under and learn once again, God is with me and my dad will get me there. For many of us, maybe we're struggling at the moment because there's bits of our past or experiences from the past that are saying you can't trust God or maybe Jesus hasn't got it. Do you know, we need to counter that lie with the truth that God is with us and Jesus is going to bring us through this. I read a great quote uh, yesterday in the, uh, one of the books that I'm reading at the moment. And the quote says, um, faith is not certainty. Faith is courage in the face of uncertainty. And we don't know what we're going to have to walk through in this current season if we're totally honest, we don't know. We can pray. We know our prayers are powerful and effective. We know our prayers will make a difference. If ever there was a time to be praying for the nation, it's now. If ever there was a time to be praying protection over our lives, it's now. If ever there was a time to be on our knees before God, it's now. And those prayers really do make a difference. But we don't know whether we're going to be the ones affected by the virus. We don't know whether someone that we love is going to be one of the fatalities from the, from the uh, virus. What we do know, though, is that Jesus will bring us through whatever because Jesus has got us. And there's always, always, always a way through. Second thing this uh, passage tells us about Jesus is it tells us he's a very different sort of king. Now, in the time of Israel, they would have been used to victory uh, celebrations. What used to happen is uh, when they went to war, when their kings would go to war, and there'd be a great battle and a great conflict, at the end of the war, whoever won it would then come back in triumph to the capital city, the city of Jerusalem. And uh, they would come back, the whole army mounted on horses, and there'd be a massive public victory celebration. And as they came back and paraded through the streets, they'd parade all the people that they'd taken captive, they'd parade all of the spoils that they'd taken in the war, and everyone would would celebrate a triumphant king. When Jesus comes to the city of Jerusalem, the city of peace, which is what Jerusalem means, when the Prince of Peace comes to that city, he comes very differently because he comes in humility and he comes seated on a donkey. And the difference between a war horse and a donkey is a donkey carries a load. And Jesus comes as God's son to carry our load. There's a wonderful verse in uh, Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, that talks about the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ um, and talks about the fact that Jesus, who was rich, made himself poor so that we who are poor might be made rich. And the thing about Easter and the kind of king that Jesus comes to be is Jesus came to empty himself and to take on our burdens or our sin and our sicknesses so we then could trade them for his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness and his life. And you see, Jesus comes to be like that donkey, to come under us, to support us, to carry us through. So what does this passage tell us about Jesus? It tells us that he's got us, that he's with us, and it tells us that he's willing to put his loving arms under us and carry us through this season. What does it tell us about us in this passage? Well, it tells us that a key to accessing the grace of God is humility, or maybe a better word for that is surrender. I don't know how many times uh, you've read your Bible, I don't know how familiar you are uh, with uh, your Bible, uh, one of the things that I looked at uh, a while ago was the number of people in the Gospels who fall at Jesus' feet 
Actually, it's a really interesting Bible study because there's a lot of them. A lot of people who come and they fall or surrender at the feet of Jesus. Uh, Maybe the greatest of those is Mary of Bethany. Uh, There's uh, many stories of uh, people who fall once at the feet of Jesus. Mary of Bethany, there's three times she comes to the feet of Jesus. The first one, she's seated at his feet and is listening to his word. The second time is uh, just after a brother, Lazarus, has died. And then she falls at the feet of Jesus and she pleads with him. And then the third time is after Lazarus has been raised from the dead. And then she falls at the feet of Jesus and she worships him. If we want to activate the presence of God in our lives, if we want to activate the grace of God in our lives, we need to learn to surrender. And maybe over this season, maybe we want to echo Mary of Bethany and surrender to three things or make three things our priorities over this season. Number one, make space and time to listen to God's word. Number two, make time and space to plead at God's feet, to be people of prayer. As I said earlier, our prayers really do make a difference. The prayer of a, of, a, of a righteous man is powerful and effective, it tells us in James. We can change the course of our nation with our prayers. And then the third thing that we can surrender to Jesus over is in worship and uh, giving our lives before him. Do you know, this current crisis has shaken this nation. Uh, In the uh, 1990s, um, Chris and I had a a couple of years where we experienced a lot of uh, struggle and uh, where we were shaken uh, a number of times. And over that period, we experienced two very painful miscarriages. Now, the second time that that happened, um, we were leading a congregation. There was a lot of pressure going on and uh, the miscarriage felt like it was almost like the final straw for us. And uh, a friend of us came to see us and said, you need to go somewhere where God is moving. And uh, they uh, paid for us to fly to Argentina. Now, at that time, there was a great revival happening in Argentina in South America. And so we flew and stayed with a friend of theirs, a church leader in Buenos Aires, and spent three weeks just sitting in the presence of God. And for us, that was a a powerful and restorative time for us. But uh, one of the things that we asked some of the people in Argentina was, what was the key that caused this revival to happen? Because revival is something that we carry in our hearts and we so want to see happen in our nation as well. And when they tracked it back, they said one of the keys to seeing revival in Argentina was when they lost the Falklands War. And uh, I don't know whether you remember the Falklands War happened in the early 1980s. Um, Argentina was struggling as a nation at that time. So they had a great idea that the uh, military leaders would invade the Falkland Islands and uh, take them back from the UK. They're really close to the Argentinian coast. And so they invaded the uh, Falkland Islands, expected a great victory, thought Britain would do nothing about it. We sent out our war force and our navy and uh, supernaturally really managed to win back the Falkland Islands. Uh, But the way they tell the story in Argentina is they say, in their opinion, the two proudest nations in the world at that point in time was the nation of Argentina and the nation of Britain. And they never expected to lose a war on their doorstep. And they said when they lost the war, it broke something in terms of their national pride. And as their national pride was broken, it made a way for them to start seeking God and bearing the knee to God. Now, I don't know how you read the current situation, but one of my uh, tellings of the current situation is I think in the West, we become very proud we become very self-sufficient. We become very independent. We have kind of felt that our, our wealth and our advances in technology protects us and that we felt very safe and like nothing could shake us. And I think one of the things that's happened with this latest virus is it's shaken us to the core and we've realised we're not as safe as we thought we were. And we've realised we might have the advances in technology and all the latest electronic toys. We might have wealth, but actually we can't protect ourselves against a virus. And I do wonder whether as a part of that, God is wanting to humble us and bring us back to the point of recognizing that we need him. It says in James chapter four, doesn't it? It says that God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. 
And one of my prayers in this season, as I'm coming to the feet of Jesus, is God, will you bring us back to that place that we realize we need you. God, we are so dependent on you. God, will you return us to our first love? So what does this passage tell us about us? Well, it tells us that actually humility is a good thing. And to realize that Jesus is our only hope is actually a real, strength, a real place of strength that takes us into a place where we can activate God's goodness. And the second thing that I was really struck by in this uh, passage is the crowd take things off and lay things down. And it's in their laying things down, it makes a way for Jesus to move forward. And one of the things I felt in my dream that God spoke ever so clearly and ever so significantly was that in the pressure of this current season, God is wanting to use the pressure to squeeze things to the surface that we need to get rid of because they will help Jesus to move more powerfully in and through our lives. Now, I don't know how you've been responding emotionally to the current crisis. We can tell a lot from our emotions. Actually, our emotions let us know what's going on inside, and uh, they often let us know what's being stirred inside. And for me, I think the, the first week or so of lockdown was about just readjusting and thinking, well, how am I going to do life now? How are we going to do church now? How are we going to be able to connect? This uh, last week has felt a bit more emotional and I felt a bit more like the stirring um, inside. So my reaction to it and the areas that I'm being squeezed. And at the start of this week, um, I got my uh, leadership team together and I said, let's make a plan for how we're going to restart church at the end of this time. And uh, the team looked at me and they were like, don't even talk to me about that. I'm still trying to struggle with just adjusting to this and make sure everyone's connected. And I realized that I was way too quickly trying to solve something. But I also realized something about myself. And one of the things I realized about myself is I love a plan. Put me in a situation, I'll make a plan. And once I've made a plan, I feel secure and I feel safe. Or in other words, I feel like I'm in control. In this current situation, I can't make a plan. I don't know how long we're going to be in lockdown. I don't know when we're going to be able to gather physically together in the same space. Or even when we can do that, how many of us will be allowed to gather together in that one space? And so part of what I'm having to do is lay down my control and say, Jesus, I'm going to trust you. And this may be uncomfortable, but I'm going to trust you. Now, your issue may not be control. You may not be a great planner. You might love uh, more spontaneous stuff. But maybe fear is a big issue for you. Maybe actually you're feeling really, really fearful. Well, maybe God has used this crisis to squeeze that up to the surface because he wants to set you free from fear. Maybe your job's under threat at the moment. Maybe you don't know how you're going to pay the bills uh, next week or next month. And uh, maybe that's brought you to a place of vulnerability like never before. Do you know... Jesus has got you. Jesus is with you. And in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. If you've got uh, food for today, delight in that and I'll provide what you need tomorrow. And maybe God is wanting to bring you to a fresh place of dependence. So what does this passage have to tell us about Jesus? Well, it tells us that Jesus has got it. That Jesus is willing to come under us and carry us and lead us through this season. What does it tell us about us? Well, it tells us that uh, seasons of squeezing are going to bring things to the surface that God wants us to shed. But in the shedding of it, God's going to be able to use that to move significantly. One of the passages of scripture I love is uh, Revelation chapter 22, right at the very end of the Bible. And uh, there in, uh, in that chapter, uh, it, it, uh, there's a picture of the throne of God and there's a river that's flowing from that throne. And as that river flows through the city of God, the city of Jerusalem, um, alongside the river, there's trees. And it says in Revelation 22, verse 5, it says, the leaves of the trees are for the healing of the nations. But you see, those leaves have to get to the nations. And for those leaves to be got to the nations, they have to be shed by the trees. 
And I felt like God was saying there's things that uh, he is going to help us to shed from our lives in this season. And if we cooperate with him and let him remove them, that's going to be a key to us being able to reach this nation. So number one, what does this passage tell us about Jesus? Number two, what does it tell us about us? Number three, how do we need to respond? Well, um, I didn't read it at the very beginning, but if you read on uh, from uh, verse 12 uh, through uh, the rest of uh, Matthew chapter 21, what you find is the very next story is Jesus, after he's entered into Jerusalem, he goes to the temple. And when he goes to the temple, he's not very happy with it. So it's the point that he overturns some tables and throws out the money changers. And in the middle of that, he says um, that my house is meant to be a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it into a robber's den. And actually what Jesus is saying is he's saying that my people, my temple, my place has lost its focus. And the third thing that I felt that God was saying in this season is I felt that God was saying he wants to refocus us as God's people back onto our primary purpose. And if you think about the um, temple at the time of Jesus, actually to have money changes in the temple wasn't a bad thing because Israel in the time of Jesus had been invaded by Rome. And part of that invasion was the Roman currency had been introduced into Israel. But at the temple, you had to use the Israelite currency. And so people would go to worship at the temple and they'd need a way of transforming um, or changing uh, Roman currency into Israelite currency. And so to have some people there that were able to do that would facilitate their worship. Um, sometimes it was difficult to get hold of the particular sacrifices that they were meant to be bringing to Jerusalem. So to have the opportunity to uh, buy those once you got to the temple actually seemed helpful. But what had happened is the means of worship and the uh, operation that had had to happen to facilitate people into worship had meant that it had distracted the temple from its primary purpose, which was for people to come and cry out for the nations of the world and to take their place in reaching the nations of the world. One of the things I've been reflecting on is in church life, sometimes we can be so busy with the practicalities of doing things that we lose the very heart of what we're meant to be doing. And that we know in the New Testament, the temple is not a building, the church is not a building. The church is flesh and blood, people like you and me uh, in our local community carrying the presence of Jesus. But it's so easy for us to get distracted by that. It's so easy for us to get caught up in the other things that we lose our primary focus. One of the things that I felt that Jesus was saying for us in this season was he, I, I felt like he was saying, I want to draw you back to your first love. I want to draw you back to your primary focus. Second thing that I felt that Jesus was saying is he wants to um, uh, re-establish in us a priority around connecting together. One of the things that I felt God spoke to me very clearly at the start of the year was he wanted to perform something in terms of a revolution in our relationships. And it's so easy to be a church that comes together on a Sunday morning and then we disappear for the rest of the week and we have no contact with one another. And actually, if we're honest, many of us have lived our lives like that. Now we're in enforced separation. And when you're in enforced separation, the first thing that you recognise is, I need other people. I need a community with me. I need some people who are caring for me. I need some people who are praying with me. I need to be connected. And I wonder whether God is using this current uh, situation to catch our attention and to tell us we need to move beyond a group of people who from time to time gather to worship and we need to really, really be a community. One of the reasons we've worked so hard to give a live chat option on a Sunday morning, one of the reasons that we're offering the opportunity to zoom in at the end is because as much as it's good to watch this on a Sunday morning, we need to go beyond that in terms of being a community. And I want to encourage you, if you're watching this and you're not properly connected in relationship, please get yourself connected. 
We've got online small groups. If you go to the What's On section of the Restore website, you can see the online small groups and prayer times that you can come and connect to. At the bottom of every page on the website, there's a, a form that you can fill out to get connected to us. We've put as many of our small groups as possible online. We've created WhatsApp groups to support people in this season. We're trying as a staff team to ring people and see whether they're okay. But if you haven't given your details and said, I want to be a part of that, we can't connect you in. And I wonder whether God has changed the way that we need to connect because God wants us to reflect again on our connections and build a togetherness in a whole different way. And so get connected. You know, loads of people in Jerusalem and uh, could welcome Jesus in in the way they did because it was one of the three pilgrimage feasts when the whole nation gathered together because God wrote into the heart of the nation of Israel that they were one body, they were one community, and they needed to operate as one family, not isolated units. This morning, we may feel like isolated units, but God wants to bring us together in that sense of we're one family. One of the things that struck me today is, is that in this last season, we're used to gathering in our separate groups as Restore. We're used to gathering in Enfield. We're used to gathering in um, Loughton. We're used to gathering at Trinity. We're used to gathering at Albany. But at the moment, we're all coming together and we're all tuning in to the same thing. And maybe that's because the uh, Lord is wanting to work through this season and make us a people who carry one heart and one mind and one spirit uh, surrounded uh, or agreed together around the purposes of God. And the last thing that I feel that God wants to maybe realign in this season for us as a church is he wants to remind us to make space, make room for our neighbours. Part of the problem with the temple when Jesus got there was the court of the Gentiles was where the money changers were operating. Now, the court of the Gentiles was the place in the temple that was available to everyone. It was available for the people who weren't uh, properly a part of the nation of Israel. It was available for the people who weren't uh, currently believing in God, but they wanted to find their way back to God. Part of our purpose as a church is to be people that are a gateway to help reconnect people to God. And that means in this season, we need to be praying for and looking for ways that we can pastor our local community. You know, two days ago, uh, as a family, we went on our Boris walk, the one walk a day that you can do uh, within the social distancing uh, protection guidelines. So we went for a walk around the block. But as we were coming back to our house, um, I met one of our neighbours, lives a few doors down. Now, he's actually come to church a couple of times in the past, lovely guy, and I often have some really good chats with him. But just as I was going by, I, I said to him, how are you doing, Mick? And he looked at me and he said, I'm doing fine. But his face said, I'm not doing fine. And he's a very open hearted guy. So I just stopped, obviously, two meters away and spoke to him and said, now, what's going on, Mick? And he told me that in the last week, four people that he's, di that he's known have died. So he's worked as a cab driver and he knows four other people who've been involved in the cab, tri cab trade and they've all lost their lives in the last week. And it's really, really rocked him. And, uh, and the rest of the family went on home and I stayed and I spent some time just talking to Mick and uh, being a listening ear. Now, I made a commitment on from that. I'm going to be praying for Mick every day. And when I am able to meet with him, I'm going to meet with him because I have a responsibility to pass to my community and my neighbours. And God has put me in the position he has to be his hands and feet at this point in time. So the triumphal entry, Palm Sunday, uh, when we think about Jesus coming into Jerusalem, three parts of the story. Number one, what does it tell us about Jesus? Well, it tells us God has got this. God has got us, he's with us, and he's gonna uh, carry us through this season, whatever it may bring. Number two, um, what does it tell us about us? Well, it tells us it's a time to repent of our pride and our independence and to bow the knee again to Jesus. 
where Jesus is bringing things up to the surface that he wants us to let go of, to surrender to him, to get free of, actually that will help us to be more like Jesus. It will help us to grow in our journey with him. And how do we need to respond? Well, we need to be willing to say to God, God, will you change whatever you need to change in me so that I can come back to my first love, so I can reprioritize my life around your priorities? God, will you help me to connect properly so the church community becomes real family, real lifeblood to me? And God, will you help me to pastor my neighborhood and the people who don't yet know you? I think it'd be really good if we take a few moments just to close our eyes and uh, maybe just to reflect on uh, what I've been sharing and what I believe God is speaking to us in this season. And then I'm going to pray. Lord, the sense I really have for this time is that on this day, at this point, but also through this season, Lord, you're wanting us to surrender to you afresh. Lord, I've been so struck by Mary and her submissive heart to kneel at your feet. And Lord, this morning as we're gathered in different places, maybe some of us in bedrooms, some of us in living rooms, uh, some of us in different situations around the world, Lord, together this morning, we want to bow the knee to you. We want to say, Lord Jesus, you are our Lord, you are our King. Lord Jesus, I want to come back to you being my first love. I want to surrender all that I am and all that I have to you. Lord Jesus, will you use the squeezing of this uh, season to remove from me the things that stop me being like you and to put in me the things that will make me more like you. Lord, in this season, I want to come to your feet to hear what you're saying. Lord, I want to come to your feet to plead for this nation and for my neighbours. And Lord, I want to come to your feet in this season to worship you and to honour you. Lord, will you use this season to transform us so that you may be able to move significantly in this nation and bring lots and lots and lots of people back to knowing you, back to encountering you. Holy Spirit, as we're on our knees before you, will you take hold of us afresh? Will you come and fill us with your spirit? In Jesus' name, amen.